Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CEO and Market Expert interviews. I'm your host, Lucien. Some of you know me as Triangle Investor from X or former Twitter. Today, I'm joined by Mari Hill, CEO of Elevate Uranium Limited, a uranium exploration and development company with assets in Namibia and Australia. Mari, you are my guest for the first time, so warm welcome to you. Thank you for coming to my show. Thank you. It's a Friday afternoon in Perth, so yeah, I'm ready to go home shortly and have a quiet ale, but yeah. Thanks okay. for having me. Great. Uh, it's early morning here in Croatia. Uh, let's tr let's go to the questions. Uh, I can skip the tradition with my guests who are for the first time in my show. They all have to tell me something about themselves. So, Mari, give us your background, your origin story, and how did you end up in Uranium, and how did you become uh, Elevate Uranium CEO? Ironically, um, I did a presentation when I was at university, and I did it on Uranium leaching. And, and never did anything for the next 20 odd years. So I was consulting, I'm a metallurgist by profession. I was consulting um, years ago and about 12, 13 years ago, I consulted to a company called Marinecker Energy, which has changed its name to Elevate Uranium and uh, looked at some sort of test work they'd done and decided that there was an opportunity to upgrade the ore and uh, to add value to it. And the Marinecker project is all they had back then, really low grade project in Namibia, Calcrete hosted, shallow, um, we, the company either walked away or became innovative. And uh, I sort of looked at a few things and we decided, the, the board decided they would back the ideas and, and we were innovative and, and now we're a 200 million market cap company. That's an excellent story. What about uh, your prior roles, Murray? Be, I, look, I, I, yeah, look, I worked for a number of companies, um, gold, nickel. And then when I consulted, I did a lot of different metals. Uh, I did a bit of uranium when I was consulting. I consulted to extract resources in Namibia. Uh, I did a little bit on the Berkeley project in Spain uh, and a few others, and then, then this one. So 12 years ago, um, well, a bit over 12 years, I got offered the role and accepted it uh, shortly after that. So I've been in this role for 12 years, and you and I talked off air about the cyclical industry that we're in. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we've ridden the uranium price down very low. Uh, and at those very low prices of eighteen twenty dollars a pound, uh, we were deciding to build up our asset base. So we were sort of counter cyclical, for want of a better word. And I know that's been used before by others, but uh, really, what we were, we we believed in the long term for uranium. It was hard to stay believer because you know brokers, you would ring brokers to raise money, and they would just ignore you. So it was very difficult. Uh, fortunately, we had good support from a. Uh, Mark Galopoulos uh, out of Melbourne and Mark Tomlinson, both of those that supported us and have done for seven years. So uh, we're very appreciative of them and uh, what they did for us back then when we couldn't raise money. So it was fantastic. So, yeah, it's good to climb out of it um, and be in a good position uh, with strong projects in the mirror in Australia. Yeah, I was in the environment when uranium was $19, so I, I can hear you. And that was the perfect time to take projects, uh, new projects, and uh, build the company. I agree on that 100%. Yeah. Uh, Murray, what about uranium market? What I want to hear your opinion on the current uranium market and the status of... What, what's your take? Look, the math is compelling, isn't it? With the supply-demand is pretty obvious. We're not supplying enough uranium to meet the current demand of the nuclear fleet. I was talking to uh, someone the other day that said, you know, the, the lithium market was built on future demand. The uranium market, market is built on current demand. So it's a yeah. very, very different scenario. Yeah. All right. So, and, and this has been looming for a long time. You know, we know that the consumption has been dropped. You know, the, the Athabasca Basin went on care and maintenance uh, projects. Some projects in Namibia went on care and maintenance. Other areas... Also, so production was cut, um, and there's always, and even when they come back on stream, we're still not meeting the, the current production request. Sorry, the current uh, demand for uranium. So, I see it's compelling, and then and then you, you throw in the electrification story. I think it's wonderful that people want to use batteries, but batteries store energy, batteries discharge energy, batteries don't generate energy. So, where's it going to come from? So it doesn't just come out of thin air. You don't sort of plug your Tesla into a a PowerPoint will hope that we've got enough power. You know, I've just been in South Africa for a week and a half and load shedding is not nice. It's 41 degrees and the power goes off at four o'clock in the afternoon and in the morning and, you know, air conditions don't work and buildings aren't designed for that. So if if that's the way renewables are taking us, uh, the load shedding, uh, because it can't supply base load power, then we're in a, we're in a world of pain. So the, the story around nuclear 
COP28 talking about increasing uh, the demand for nuclear, you know, tripling by 2050 uh, in over 20 countries, I think is very positive. Um, yes, that's the future demand story, but the current demand is the big story at the moment. We just don't have enough supply. And, and the only way to incentive supply is uranium price to go up. So the uranium price has gone up to $100 a pound uh, and a few uh, mines are coming back on stream, but still not filling the gap, nowhere near filling the gap. So we're still we're still a long way from um, you know ever meeting that demand. So I can see that uranium price is going to continue to rise and sustain a high rise. And, and I sort of forecast 100 bucks a while ago, but I didn't know when it was going to happen. It's like betting on a car driving around a racetrack. You know it's going to run out of fuel, but you just don't know which lap it's going to be on. We all knew the uranium price was going to go up. We just weren't sure which year or which month it was going to happen. So I, I'm pretty certain it's going to be beyond 200, but where we don't know. Excellent point, uh, and I tend to agree with you, what you said. Uh, we are seeing a correction right now in uranium price as well. Not so in, in uranium prices, but in uranium equities. Do you believe this is a small correction normal in the bull markets, or do you believe we could see more pain ahead? I think two words, buying opportunity. I, I, I think, um, you know, you, you don't see, if our commodity, if, if our equity price is rising at a rapid rate, right? And going in one direction, you know, it's going to fall quickly. But if it starts climbing, it goes up, comes back a little bit, up, back a little bit. You know, that that's a healthy rise. So we just probably had a little bit more pullback than we anticipated. The news around the Cameco meeting their, you know, expecting to meet their target production this year, I think was just an opportunity for people to take profits. Um, you yeah. know, they're saying, well, hang on, but we've got too much uranium. Well, no, we haven't got too much uranium. And considering that we did a capital raise at 42 cents in December, we went to 69, you know, there's 50% plus profit. So a lot of uh, those investors were probably bought in at 42 cents or out, right? So, you know, if you can make 50% in less than a month, uh, if you're a lithium uh, investor, you, you would have done it on the way up. On the way down, you've been in one, a lot of pain right now. So maybe some of those, uh, you know, they're just taking to profits because they're concerned about, you know, what might happen. But, I think now it presents a buying opportunity. Uh, you're never going to pick the bottom. You're never going to pick the top. But uh, I think it's a perfect opportunity. It's just, it's just, a, it's a trend upwards, and uh, it's just a small pullback. Yeah, personally, I like those non-fundamental pullbacks where you can buy quality names like your company at the discount. So. I, I agree with you. Uh, your company has two uh, has projects on two continents in Africa, specifically in Namibia and in Australia. Before we talk about your projects, I would like to hear more about those two jurisdictions. Let's start with Namibia. How was your experience so far with doing business in Namibia? Fantastic. I went across there the first time in 2009 with Extract Resources on the HUSAB project. I come home to my wife and said, we're going for holidays in Namibia. We're taking the kids at 10, 11 years of age. In 2011, we went back. Fantastic self-drive holiday. People are really nice, really friendly, um, and beautiful country to be in. Um, the wildlife is magnificent. Uh, the people are just very nice the way they treat you. The food's great. Uh, it's a great jurisdiction. And then from a from a uh, mining perspective, a uranium perspective, it's the only country in the world with a dedicated uranium association. So the Namibian Uranium Association do a fantastic job. They're the conduit between explorers, developers and producers, and then government stakeholders, general public. They do a fantastic job of promoting us. Right? And when you consider, you know, what jurisdictions around the world have had uranium mines developed over the last period of time, Rossing have been operating continuously since 1976, longest running continuously operating uranium mine in the world. Right. Then you've got um, HUSAB was developed by probably 2014. I might get the years wrong here. Uh, Arana's Copy Project 2012, uh, Paladin and Lang Heinrich 2008. Uh, and then we've just seen forces have got a mining license. Uh, Bannerman just got their mining license. Deep Yellow just got their mining license. So it's got a history of uranium, right? Approvals for uranium, uh, development of projects. So we're in a, we're in a fantastic jurisdiction um, for uranium, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, that's a positive side of the story. Is there a negative? side of the story or some field that uh, can be improved in doing business in Namibia? I don't think there's ever a perfect country in the world. Of course. I live in Australia. We're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, uh, some of our people live in glass houses and throw a lot of stones. 
So, uh, you know, uh, look, there's always, you can always find something. Uh, but I think when all things considered, there's probably, uh, it, it's probably one of the best jurisdictions in the world for uranium, right, without too much doubt. Um, I can find a lot of things to pick on in Western world countries uh, about their policies. You know, for instance, you know, in Australia, parts of Australia don't like uranium at all. Can't even, you can't even do any exploration. Um, so, you know, and other parts of the world, I mean, look at, say, the parts of the US when I was in the gold industry, some states weren't allowed to use cyanide in gold mining because it was, you know, wrong. Uh, and I, I think uh, the woke world that we live in now in the Western world are having a big influence on on the negativity around some commodities and mining itself. Um, but the more the more we develop and need batteries uh, and go to EVs, the more mining we need. So, yeah, look, it's... Uh, you could probably pick holes in every country, but I don't. I think there's very few to pick in Namibia. Okay, same question for Australia. Uh, how is doing business in Australia? And I mean, Australia is more regulatory compared to Canada. Uh, the 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 rules are much more strict. So, how is doing business in Australia? Yeah, look, I don't know Canada too well, but certainly Australia's got a lot of red tape. Um, so. You know, when you when you look at Namibia as a comparison, so Namibia, you apply for an exploration license and the government grants you a provisional one, then you've got 12 months to go and get environmental clearance. Once you get environmental clearance, they then give you a full grant. Mm -hmm. Then you just write a letter to the minister to say, we're going to drill these holes. Don't need a response. In Australia, you've got your environmental clearance, you've got your tenement. Now you've got to write a, write a mine management plan, you've got a radiation management plan, that's all got to be approved. So mm -hmm. it's sort of double double process all the way through. I mean, you've already got, it's your tenement, you've already got environmental clearance. Why can't we drill? No, no, you've got to do all this work. So it slows everything down. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we're producing uranium. You know, BOSS are just starting up again. Um, ERA have just closed down uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, obviously BHP's Olympic Dam project is is uh, producing uranium. So we do, and Heathgate as well, uh, producing uranium here in South Australia. So we've got a history uh, and we are producing. Um, and certainly... Yeah, a bit more red tape, but you do understand the system, all right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's not too bad. Definitely, uh, Murray. Let's discuss your all your projects, starting with your Namibian asset, uh, your flagship copies project. Can you give me an overview of the project and current status? Yeah, so we were um, we discovered it in July two thousand nineteen. I was on a tent on site um, back then. We had a I think we had a market cap of five million. Uh, we couldn't afford much. Uh, I was out there sort of supervising the, the drilling. And since then, we've increased the number of rigs on it. Uh, we went to two rigs in, I think it was uh, July after that, 2022. May of 2023, last year, went to three rigs. Our main resource was 20 million pound. And last November, we increased that to 48 million pound. So those three rigs have been drilling up until now. Uh, and we're expecting next, next month to announce a resource update. Okay. It's going to be in excess of 48 million pounds, right? Where it is, we don't know, and I'm not going to predict anything. But from this point, we believe it's time to do take this project further. So let's take it from inferred, because inferred resources, you can't announce financial metrics around study. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to indicated drawing. So we'll commence that now. Uh, in fact, Wondering's already commenced that uh, as we finish the inferred, uh, and that will continue all the rest of this year. So that will feed into a study, right? And then the other side of it is, our upgrade process we developed in-house, which reduces the cost base substantially for these style of projects. We're going to do metallurgical test work on that. We're going to collect samples. I'm going to cross in April. We're going to collect a heap of samples from different test pits. We're going to bring those across to Perth, and we'll do test work on them. We'll then feed those results into the study, but we'll also use those results to design a pilot plan. We think the best thing for, the, for us as a company um, is to demonstrate upgrade in a pilot plan so we want to do that next year so that's where we're heading with that and we'll see what the outcomes of the studies are i mean i could talk a lot around the studies but we probably need to talk a little bit about upgrade before i tell you too much about around okay. the, the okay. sort of components of the study i suppose yeah i read the very interesting stuff on your uh, presentation uh, you have a very shallow, shallow resource 50 percent within six seven meters of surface and 90 percent within 15 meters of surface that is a great potential to support low cost strip ratio future mining, right? Look, yeah, ninety five percent within fifteen one five meters, absolutely shallow. That's that's yeah. really shallow. So, um, 
yeah, it's going to be a, a sort of surface miner type mining operation uh, with a rotary drum with teeth on it. It'll cut it about half a metre deep uh, and that'll feed straight into our uh, our wet plant. Um, so hence no 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 uh, blasting and drilling and no uh, no crushing. So a lot of dust generation gone, but really shallow. Uh, you feed that shallow low cost mining method into our upgrade process, which is you know reduces the cost base. It makes for a pretty good project. Definitely, and uh, that brings me to to the next next question: cost of drilling. It must be cheap over there, right? When you're only drilling twenty eight meters deep, and in fact, to the north of Copies, the very northern end, we're drilling sixteen meters deep uh, because there's no mineralization below six meters. Each hole is costing us a thousand bucks to drill. That's inexpensive exploration. So what that does is it means you can, and also we've got uh, our drill rigs stay out of sight on the weekend with the tents, and then they'll go out in the Monday morning from the coast to town. They'll come back Friday afternoon. Now while they're out there, they'll drill, drill five holes per rig per day. So we've got four rigs working at the moment, a fifth one next month. So that's that's over a hundred holes a week being generated now, another hundred twenty-five plus in in next month. That's a lot of holes. So you can get over a lot of ground. Right and, and get you know because we're the copies is over strike length of twenty kilometers right so we're drilling at a hundred meter by hundred meter grid so there's a lot of holes to drill so inexpensive exploration but what it also does is it throws sort of conventional exploration on its head a little bit because what you're generally doing drilling is generally the last thing you do in an exploration program you're doing all these geotechnical geo you know airborne surveys and all this trying to identify where you want to drill now. When it costs a thousand bucks a hole, right? Let's say you want to drill over two kilometers, you want to test two kilometers of length, you drill every 200 meters, you drill a hole. 10 holes is 10,000 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So it sort of changes your thought process a little bit. And maybe this is because I'm coming from a metallurgical background, I'm not a geologist. I think about it differently. And we sit down yeah. with the geos and say, well, do we really need to spend months and months trying to establish where we're going to drill when we can just go and drill it be cheaper? Now, that doesn't mean you drill everywhere in Namibia, right? But, you know, you do have your geological models that you're working to, but it sort of changes your, your whole thought process uh, and your approach. Um, now, you can't apply that in Australia because of the resources are a little bit deeper. Uh, Mineralisation is a bit deeper. We're really shallow stuff like we are drilling and inexpensive exploration. It does change your approach to it. Yeah, yeah. And you said five drill rigs at one point you will have there. How did you manage to secure five rigs? I mean, it's not easy, let's say, in Canada to secure five rigs on site. Oh, look, we, there's a couple of things there. We're in Namibia. Uh, we we operate a little bit differently. We actually pay our bills on time. So we make sure that our drillers are paid right in a timely manner. Right. So they're generally within 15 days they've got money in their hand. So they want to work for us. We have a very good manager in Namibia. It's got very clear communication uh, with them. So they, you know, sitting down with them in November last year, they were very, very appreciative of the way we operate, the communication we get. So they enjoy working for us. So, you know, we said, look, we're thinking about increasing our rigs. And one company said, we'll, we'll give you all five, right? right? So there are rigs available, uh, which is good. I mean, a bit of a downturn in other commodities has, has probably helped that a little bit. Uh, of course. But yeah, they enjoy working for us. They enjoy the work. Uh, you know, you're, you're in it, you're back in town on, on the weekend. So you're not sort of sitting out in the middle of the desert for months on end. You're going out there Monday morning, come back Friday afternoon. So it's actually quite a good job for them and, and they enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, Murray, when are you targeting first production in ideal circumstances, if you can give us some timelines? Well, when you think about it, we're, we're starting a, an indicated drill program now. That's That's 12 plus months to finish that. We've then got, you know, by the time we collect metallurgical samples, do our test work program, yeah. Um, you know, that, that's running a, a parallel time frame. And then you're feeding into a study. Now, the study, as I alluded to before, is going to pick up a lot of components we need to, to determine uh, the outcome of. And then we move into a pilot plant. Then you move into a more advanced study. Realistically, you're five years away. Okay. Okay. That's, Realistically. That, that, that is a reasonable uh, time frame, definitely. Yeah. Uh, let's move to, I don't know if I will pronounce it right, here a bad project that's pretty good that's very good okay uh here about projects and namib four uh they are adjacent properties to copies what is the current status over there and what are the plans for those two 
So they're our second and third discoveries of the four over the last four years. Uh, Herobev, we uh, have got a drill rig on it now. Um, there's a requirement in Namibia to reduce your area by 25% of your tenement each renewal. Uh, copies we've applied for zero because it's just full of uranium all over the tenement. Uh, so we just uh, we just did some drilling to understand where we want to drop ground. So sort of sterilisation drilling. And now we're moving into exploration drilling and then we'll move into um, resource drilling. So there's 16 kilometres of mineralisation there we've identified previously. So we're going to resource drill that. So we want to come up with a resource later this year uh, on that area. Now move four. It's one of those projects that I think is probably frustrating, I'd call it. Um, I can I can take, I took our chairman there last February, I drove out the site and I picked up a piece of carnitide off the surface, uh, mm -hmm. nearly the size of my little fingernail. And you go and drill a hole there, you don't find any on that particular location. So, you know, the, we still understand the geology. There's uranium out there, right? I can find it on surface, um, but how does it all fit together? So we need a lot more geological brain power on that one just to understand it better and then work out where the origin of this rain is sitting on surface that we can see. Now, sitting on surface it does, doesn't constitute a resource. It's, you just see it there. So it's either blown in from somewhere or it's, you know, it's probably not washed in lately because you get 10 or 12 millimetres or 10 or 20 millimetres of rain a year out there. So it's not as though it's going to be washed in with rain. Uh, but, yeah, so we've got a little bit more work to do on those just to understand, or, sorry, on, on NAMI 4 to understand that better. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's move a little more to the north. It's called the Central Erongo area. You have Marenica and Capri projects there. Give us an overview and plans for those two. How advanced are they? Yeah, so Marenica or Marenica, uh, that's said, but Marenica is how the Africans say it. Marenica is tend to how we say it in Australia. Okay. That was our namesake project, um, you know, up until uh, what, June? June 2021, we changed their name to Elevate Uranium. Uh, that's a low-grade project. That was what we developed upgrade on. Uh, we were trying to work out what to do with it. We put it in, we put it in a retention license for a while. Uh, it's still in retention license. Uh, we're going to do some exploration on it because it's still 21 kilometres from the western edge of the resource to the western edge of the tenement boundary. So there's some prospective areas there we want to drill. Uh, and then we probably want to start doing some indicated drilling to understand the resource a bit better in terms of how it how it was sort of, I suppose, the confidence level, how it changes from inferred to indicated. Are we increasing the grade? Are we, is it reducing what's happening there? So a bit of work to do on that. But initially, just do a bit of exploration. Capri is 16 kilometres of mineralisation. You heard me say it at uh, here about 16 kilometres. seems to be a common number. Um, what we've identified mineralisation there, we want to go and drill that to a resource. But just on the western side of where the mineralisation is, the geologists tell me it looks exactly like copies three. So we mm -hmm. want to go and do uh, some exploration drilling there. Um, so we're just having a, a, a bit of a, a land uh, access issue at the moment. We're sorting through. Uh, there's a sort of confusion around as to whether you need land access because uh, where the Nami Bear is, we're inside National Park. That's easy to operate in, um, but we're sort of communal land. Uh, we're just having to sort of work through a couple of things. We're just trying to finalise that with the, the lawyers at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, there's a misunderstanding in some parts of the government or, uh, and or different understanding to the industry. So we're just sort of sorting that out. But we're hoping to be on the ground in a couple of months to start drilling there. Do you have, that, that, that's my next question, do you have approximate time frame? When do you think you could start drilling uh, those two? And how big could this drilling campaign be? Well, five drill rigs will be working next month. Two of those will be at, at Copies. One will be at Herobib, one at Capri, and one floating. So that fifth rig will be moving from site to site. So it'll do some work at Nami Ford, it'll do some work at Atacatama, it'll do some work at Maranika um, and some other tenements that uh, we're, we're, we're in the process of getting granted. So there have been provisional grant waiting for the environmental clearance to come through to the full grant. It'll, it'll hit those. So we're hoping with that fifth rig that we'll go from four discoveries in four years to five or six in five. But, you know, if... Things are looking good at Capri and Hirabev and others. Who's to say we stop at five rigs? Great. <laughs> Excellent. Let's uh, jump to another continent. That's Australia, your Australian assets. You have two 100% owned projects in Northern Territory portfolio, and you have some JVs, joint ventures. Uh, your yep. project Angela and Minerva projects are your 100% owned. What is the status and plans for those two? So Angela is a 31 million pound resource at 1310 ppm, so a really good grade. 
um, it's it's a sandstone hosted deposit that dips at nine degrees. Now, for us, we consider core assets to be assets where our upgrade process can add value. Um, at uh, at Angela, there's a somewhere in the order of 120 kilos per tonne asset consumption. Um, so when you know the big companies like Paladin and, and Cameco had it in joint venture years ago, 12 to 14 years ago, they didn't quite know what to do with it. We stepped in and gone, okay, we know what we're doing here. We did four bench scale tests and nobody optimizes anything in four bench scale tests. So we've got optimization work to do, but we've reduced asset consumption by 80%. So this project well and truly has a life. That's a huge reduction in asset consumption. Now, how much further can we go? Well, bench scale test work and optimization test work later on, we'll find that out. But we've proven to ourselves that we can do something. And then the other thing was we did some seismic work on it because we bought these assets. The other thing, we bought these assets in December of 2019. We paid a small amount of cash and the rest shares. Now the equivalent um, dollar value and the pounds in the ground equates to four cents US per pound of uranium in the ground. When I consulted to extract resources on the project in, in Namibia, they eventually sold that, I think it was 2012. Uh, they sold that for $4.50 per pound in the ground. Now, I'm not in any say way suggesting that we're another extract or we've got another HUSAP, but okay. I'm just putting it into perspective. You know? Sure. Um, and that wasn't the top of the market. That, you know, Remember, the top of the market was 2007, uh, and it was, two, it was five years later. So we bought these at a really, really low price. Right. So, And then three months after we bought them, the transaction um, finalised, COVID hit. And Perth was the most isolated city in the world based on its proximity to the next capital city. And our premier made sure that we kept that reputation. We couldn't go anywhere. So eventually after three years, we could go and do something. So we did a seismic survey at Angela. And what we established was uh, this, we found this lens that's mineralized, but we found a lens underneath. It. Never been drilled. Let's mm -hmm. go and drill it. So we want to go and drill it next, this year, sorry, uh, and just see what's there. Who knows? Minerva, uh, other side of Alice Springs, north of Alice Springs, right near our joint venture um, projects. It was discovered in 1978. Uh, they drilled a number of holes. Ten of them hit mineralization greater than 10,000 ppm or 1%. So now 1 we're percent. talking about Athabasca Basin grades, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Very high. Hasn't been drilled since. Right? So we want to go and do some diamond holes into it, get some structural information to understand the structure to then work out how best to explore this better. So that's the issue there. We just don't understand the structure. So we've got a bit of a drilling planned in, in Australia this year as well. Okay. What about the uh, joint venture projects you have? Who are your partners uh, partners over there? And uh, what's your plan with those projects? So our partners are Energy Metals, um, predominantly Chinese-owned ASX-listed company. Uh, we own 20 to 24% of the projects. Uh, joint venture meeting um, last month, uh, they informed us that for the first time in about 10 years, they're going to spend some money on exploration. Okay. Uh, so we've got a cash call for that. Uh, so we're looking forward to them doing some exploration work, adding to the resource, uh, testing deeper targets and also Greenfield's targets. So yeah, a bit of a range of tests, uh, sorry, a bit of range of drilling to do there. Okay. Uh, what about Western Australian portfolio, uh, Obagoma project and Thatcher Soap project? Uh, can you tell me more about them? Uh, what is yeah, the plan? Look that unfortunately I live in that particular state, Western Australia, and uh, our uh, government don't like uranium, full stop. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's there's other uranium companies, our peers, that have only assets in 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 Western Australia, working hard on government to sort of turn that around. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> we're not doing a lot with those assets, to be honest. Um, we just sort of focus so much. There's so much happening in Namibia and a bit happening in Northern Territory. We just haven't put out any effort into these West Australian assets because it's sort of, you know, bang for your buck wise, four discoveries in four years in Namibia and 48 million pound resource and your first discovery is, is far better than sort of fighting the government in Western Australia. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you mentioned your own technology. You have a process development patent 100% owned. It's called U Grade Upgrade. Upgrade. Tell me more about it, please. I'm very interested to hear more. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great great uh, asset that we have. Um, we developed it on the Maranaka project because, as I said before, you either innovate or you walk away. So what yeah. we did was we looked at detailed mineralogy to understand the minerals present and their associations. Once we understood that, then we thought, okay, we can upgrade the uranium. Mm -hmm. We tried to do that. Yeah, you got some fantastic from a from a sample that's running eighty ppm. We got seven thousand ppm grade. 
but we've got very poor recovery. Mm -hmm. So the, as we try to get recovery out, we just lost grade. So then we established that the best thing to do is concentrate the gang mineral, throw it away. Concentrate another gang mineral, throw it away. That's counterintuitive. Who thinks to concentrate a gang mineral, right? So what that means is that with the very last stage is the only stage we concentrate your uranium. The rest is, is concentrating gang minerals and throwing them away. So that's counterintuitive, innovative, and hence patentable. So we have three patents around the world on this process. Right? And what it does is because you're, you're decreasing the mass all the way through to the point where the mass going to leach is less than 5% of what you mine. So the, the leach operation is the highest unit cost operation in a processing facility, right? So if you've reduced that to less than 5%, and now your OPEX and CAPEX are really low for your leach, right? And of course, as you're reducing mass all the way through, you're reducing size of unit operations and hence you're reducing capital and operating as well. So to the point where we've done a sort of scoping study uh, years ago and we established it was about a 50% reduction in CAPEX and a 50% reduction in OPEX compared to conventional processing for these ores. But the other thing about these ores is all of the ore contains calcite. Calcite consumes acid, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't leach it with acid because it's just, it just doesn't make sense, right? It costs too much money. So yeah. then the top 25% or the top three to four metres of the ores in Namibia are full of sulphate. The alternative to alkali, sorry, the alternative to acid is alkali. Sulphate consumes alkali. So hence you can't leach the top 25%. So then you're only leaching 75% of your ore, processing 75% of your ore. Step in, upgrade, get rid of the calcite, it's gone, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter about the sulfate because you're going to go to a sulfuric acid leach, right, which is hydrogen sulfate. So what that means is instead of going to an alkali leach with only 75% of your ore and 93 degrees Celsius, you go to an acid leach at ambient temperature on 100% of the ore. So a big difference there. And then, of course, the other thing it does is you can take the calcite we concentrate and throw it into the leach tail, completely neutralise the tailings, precipitate any metals that might have leached, and you've got an inert tailings. So, but the best thing about it is that we produce less than 5% of the mass that we can take somewhere else. So you can leach it and refine it yourself, or don't build a leach refinery. Third parties in Namibia have leach refinery capacity. There's an option for you. So, or alternatively, you build a leach refinery yourself and you yeah. bring, at copy say, you bring a Herobev concentrate in, you bring a Capri concentrate in, you can even bring a Maranica concentrate down. So all of a sudden, you're bringing your projects closer together because you're transporting a low mass concentrate. So that means that, so what I was alluding to before about our study, so we want to do a study that says, okay, what does the cost structure look like with, without upgrade? What does it look like with upgrade? So let's confirm, right? Yes, it's 50% reduction in CapEx and office. Great. Now we've got upgrade. What do we do? Do we leach on site and refine to reduce yellow cake? Or do we take it to a third party? Right? And the good thing is if you take it to a third party, they go, well, no, we're going to give you horrible terms. You go, well, okay, that's yeah. fine. We'll go and leach it and refine it ourselves. Thank you. Yeah. So we've got, you know, we've got a bit of a leg to stand on when we go and talk to a third party. And do you then go, well, hang on, maybe we leach it ourselves and take a solution to them or there's so many options we've got available and how does it fit in with our other project? So that's why I'm saying that the, the study is going to be a little bit longer uh, than normal studies because we've got so many things we want to look at to understand, to make sure that what we take forward is the right thing for the project. That's very, very interesting and a great move for the company. I have to agree on that. Uh, Murray, your company has a lot of projects. Uh, what is the plan here? Will you continue to operate on two continents with multiple projects or there is a plan maybe to sell JV some projects and focus on a certain project, let's say Namibia project? Yeah, look, we, we have thought about this a number of times and, and I've just said like recently, our land position in Namibia, if you added all the other uranium explorers and producers in Namibia, you add their land position up, cumulatively, it's less than our total land package, mm -hmm. right? And you sort of go, oh, that's, that's, is that positive or negative? But the thing about it is that it's inexpensive exploration. So you can service that, right? Yeah. So if we couldn't service it, I would be suggesting that we have farm-ins or we get rid of some of our projects. But no, we can service it. We've got the people, we've got availability of rigs, 
we've got the finances to do it. So we will continue to service that. And what we'll do is you, you've got that typical pyramid of, you know, expiration down the bottom through to production at the top. We're trying to move as many projects forward towards the top as we can. Now, Copies is the first of those. Kiribati Capri, the next two, right? Maranika sits in there as well. So we want to continue to, to build our resource base, right, and then continue to take those resources through to potentially um, production. Pardon me. So, and then Australia, you know, we do work on those as well. So while we're able to um, fund our exploration efforts and moving through the study phase, then we'll continue to do what we do. If, if we can't, then we need to look at another avenue, right? But at the same time, we know there's assets around that are available or potentially available that we want to have a look at. We also know that we have core assets. Core is when we can add value through upgrade or we can add value through simple exploration, right? Now, non-core assets, we might just move on, right? Um, and core assets, we might try and pick up some more core assets. So those, it'll move up and down both continents, uh, both the river and Australia, well, sorry, countries, we'll be looking to add and subtract from our position. But whilst we're able to service it with the team we've got and with the, and we're building, we're building the team. 18 months ago, we had one geo in Namibia, one in Australia. We're about, we've just offered a seventh geo a job in Namibia, right? And we've got three geos in Perth and probably moving to four shortly. So that's huge growth over a very short yeah. period of time. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're building a team. Um, we've got the funds to do it. We've got the rigs available. Um, we'll continue to do what we do um, uh, and do best. Okay, I understand that approach and it makes sense. Uh, but let's discuss some M&A. I believe we are entering a phase in the bull market where we could uh, see increased M&A activity. So I would like to hear your thought on that. Spe specifically, do you have interested parties knocking on your door, asking around about your projects? I've got to ask, have you got a bug in my office? <laughs> I'm wondering if you've been listening to my conversation. Look, certainly, you're in, a, you're in the hottest commodity on the planet, right? Yeah. Pardon the pun. And everybody wants to talk about uranium. I mean, up until six months ago, we're the only company on the ASX with uranium in our name. Since then, there's been a few opportunistic, opportunistic companies come along and put uranium in their name and start chasing assets. We've been in this game for, since 2006, we've been in uranium, this company. So we know what we're doing. Um, and, we, and we've lasted the time, right, at low uranium prices. So there's companies that just come on and they're looking for assets. So I reckon I get one call a week to sell a project to us, <laughs> one call a week to buy a project's office. So, you know, we... We've ignored um, a lot. Like, for instance, we've looked at the US. Oh, what a great market to be in. But that's three countries we would be in, three continents. That's pushing us, that's stretching us too far. Definitely. And we don't think that's the right thing to do for our shareholders and for our team, right? Two area, the two countries we're in now is probably enough for us. So we then sort of focus our attention on those two. Um, but yeah, look, there's a lot to happen and, and a lot will happen, I think, as the uranium price, as it gets closer to $200 a pound, there'll be a lot more M&A. Uh, good answer. And you mentioned, okay, projects in the US are not an option for you. That that really makes sense. But if you will go out and search for projects or companies to acquire them, what profile would be interesting to you? I mean, what kind of projects, jurisdictions? Um, tell me more. Project juris jurisdiction is clearly in the movie in Australia. Right? That's where we know best. Um, we know the system very well in both of those. And we're looking at assets that, uh, that would be considered core. So as I said before, core is where we could add value through upgrade application um, and through a simple exploration. So if we look at a project and go, yeah, okay, it's not necessarily core from a metallurgical viewpoint, but gee, look at the simple exploration effort we can put into this and add so much value to it. So it becomes core cool for that reason. But, you know, you see some projects around that are complicated, that asset consumption is too high, a bit like Angela going, oh, well, big ones are going, no, it's too hard. Well, yeah. come along and yeah, we'll have a look at it. Yes, we can make a difference here. So it, it, it is that jurisdiction. We, we stuck on those two um, and, um, and also the core assets in that respect. Okay. We heard your story, your background. We know who are you. Who else is on the team, on the board of your company? Who are the people behind the company? 
Yeah, look, we've got uh, – so an ASX company needs a minimum of three directors. We've only got three, uh, and I'm one of them. Uh, then we've got Andrew Bantock, uh, who's our chairman, and we've got Stephen Mann. Andrew's been a lot in uranium. Stephen Mann, uh, ex Kojima, who was, you know, eventually made their way through to Rano. So he's had a lot of uranium experience uh, in Perth. Uh, he's across in Argentina now trying to get some uranium happening over there. Uh, so, yeah, a small team there. And from a management point of view, there's myself uh, and Shane McBride's our CFO slash company secretary. So he's a lot of uranium experience as well. So, that's essentially the sort of top part of the team. And then obviously geologists and general managers and general manager in Namibia and the geological team over there. Okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit on the share structure, uh, your major shareholders. You have some ETFs on board, uh, Sprat, I think. Who else is on, uh, in your share register? So I think in order um, is Sprat ETF is a top shareholder, uh, board and management next. And when you consider we've only got four in that team, um, you know, we've got 5.1% of the company. Um, I, I spent 612,000 exercising options in you know, uh, December last year. Okay, they're a reasonable amount in the money, but okay. it's still a big commitment. And tell your wife, you know, she's got to scrape and try and find 612,000 to put into the company. So, yeah, well, look, we, we believe pretty strongly. A lot of skin in the game there, a lot of belief in where we're going. Um, and then we, as you say, the, the Global X um Need another ETF, and uh, we've got a black one named Retsos, private um, private individual out of out of Victoria in Australia. Uh, he's been with us for seven years, by the way, um, buying and selling. So fantastic that he's made money, um, and but he's still in there. Um, so uh, that's good. And then sort of you know we we move out beyond that. So yeah, no no real strong heavy you know plus twenty percent. You know like the biggest is seven and a half percent. Okay. Okay. Uh, you mentioned ra you did a raise in December at uh, forty two cents. Uh, what is the current cash position of your company, and when when do you believe you will have to go out on the financial markets and raise more money? Yeah. So we raised, as you say, in December. We've got four, fifteen point seven million in the bank as as of, and we're talking Australian dollars. Yeah. Um, uh, as of December thirty one, we're burning about eight hundred thousand a month we let it go to about 950 with the extra rig um in in um in march so we've got enough to keep us going for a period of time you know if we start spending money on more rigs or m a or so forth then yeah maybe we'll have to raise money but at this point in time we're not in busy we need to go out in our Okay. Wait till your price is 200 bucks, maybe. Okay. Uh, final question. Uh, possible news flow from the company in the next uh, period, let's say six to eight months. What What is about to happen? Tell us more. So the news flow will be a resource update on copies um, next month. And then uh, then we move it in indicator drilling, metallurgical test works. There'll be some of the odd news flow come out of that, but you know, not a lot. Uh, then you've got um, three other rigs. So you've got uh, drilling at Capri, drilling at Hira Bev, um, and then you've got the exploration rig uh, as well in terms of Greenfields exploration happening. So it depends on how those go, but news flow out of those, and then the Australian um, drilling programs as well, sort of mid to later in the year, there'll be a bit of news flow out of those, but predominantly coming out of copies initially, uh, and then as, as we progress with exploration on the others uh, and resources, they'll come out of those. And maybe some M and A. You never know, of course. <laughs> uh, never know what might happen. Exactly. Make uh, no promises. Yeah, that was Murray Hill, CEO of uh, Elevate Uranium. Uh, Murray, thank you very much for coming to my show. It was a great chat, and I believe we will chat sometime soon again. Yeah, thanks for your time. It was great, and uh, I hope listeners appreciate it. And uh, certainly, we'll be back again. It was a good chat. Enjoyed it. Thank you.